Did you know that the wealthy once bought tulips for six times the average person annual salary? Or perhaps that onions were once worth less than the bags that carried them? Tulip mania and the onion future tradings ban are two strange, hilarious pieces of agricultural history that I wanted to share with you today. We'll learn a little bit about Holland's former obsession with tulips, what future trading is, and how to almost literally flood a market with onions, courtesy of the Onion King himself. While hilarious today, at the time, the mania was supposedly all consuming and a little bit like NFTs today. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Multi-Level Mondays. I'm the Illuminati, and today we've got a two for one episode about tulip mania and onion futures trading. Also, as a bit of a content warning, there will be a brief mention of game ending yourself in the latter half of the episode, so please be aware of that. Now, let's get right into it, and we'll start with Tulip Mania. During the Dutch Golden Age, there was a brief period of Tulip Mania, which went exactly how it sounds. People were absolutely bonkers over tulips. This later became one of the most famous market bubbles and crashes of all time, though as a disclaimer, recent scholars say tulip mania may have been exaggerated as a parable of greed and excess. I'll touch upon that a little later, but please keep that in mind as we move forward. Anyway, as the story goes that in the mid late 1500s, tulips were introduced to Europe through trade with Turkey. One of the people to first receive the flowers was botanist Carlos Clusius, who established the botanic garden at the University of Leiden in the 1590s. He cultivated the tulips there, and around that time, the flower also found its way to Holland. By the turn of the century, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange opened up and flowers became all the rage, with tulips the most in demand. Not only were they beautiful with many varieties, but they were also seen as sacred to the Ottomans too. It had been said that sultans would wear a tulip on the tip of their turbans and that it meant the flower of God in Arabic script. It didn't take long for demand to vastly outnumber the supply, driving the cost of tulips ever higher. Plus broken tulips or those that are infected by tulip breaking virus have streaks that almost look like flames on the petals. These ones were even rarer and seen as even more valuable, driving up the demand for more unique tulips even more. In 1610, Britannica claims that a single bulb of a new variety was acceptable as dowry for a bride. And a flourishing brewery in France was allegedly exchanged for a single bulb of the variety Tulip Brassiere. Broken or streaked tulips were stolen from Clausius's garden and their seeds became the foundation for a lively tulip trade. According to the BBC, Adrian Pau, the closest thing Holland had to a prime minister at the time, built a garden full of artfully positioned mirrors with a few rare tulips in the center. Even Pau couldn't genuinely fill his own garden with tulips despite his wealth and status as owning a rare bulb was a bit like owning a champion racehorse. Not only were they valuable in their own right, but even more valuable because of champion offspring, making them appear like a good long-term investment. In Holland, even middle-class and poorer families decided to dip their toes into the tulip market, trying to earn a profit. They mortgaged their homes, estates, and industries to buy bulbs, only to resell them for more than they paid. However, as these sales and resales happened before the bulbs even left the ground, this did become a sort of futures trading. The demand for tulips was so high that allegedly at one point, it would cost as much as six times the average person's salary just to acquire a single rare bulb. Now these bulbs sold for 1630 florins, gold coins that are a bit difficult to translate to dollars, though experts rough estimate is the best kind of tulip would go for about $750,000 by today's US currency. Although to be fair, many did sell for 50 to $150,000 as well. Professional traders or stock jobbers also got in the action. And from 1633 to 1636, tulip mania was in full swing. One Scottish journalist, Charles Mackay, famously wrote in his 1841 book, Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, the wealthiest merchants to the poorest chimney sweeps jumped into the tulip fray, buying bulbs at high prices and selling them for even more. Some say that foreigners also became smitten with the same frenzy and money poured into Holland from all directions. At the peak of this tulip mania, a sailor who mistook a rare bulb for an onion and ate it was allegedly charged with a felony and thrown into prison. One bulb known for its flame-like white and red petals allegedly sold for more than the cost of a mansion in a fashionable Amsterdam neighborhood. There's no shortage of stories like these and looking back, they sure sound utterly ridiculous. And this is only made worse by the fact that tulips only bloom once a year. It just, it doesn't seem worth it, does it? 
Well, tulip mania seemed like it would never end in the moment, but seemingly even faster than it started, the mania bubble burst. According to Investopedia, this is in large part due to the fact that many people purchased their bulbs on credit, hoping to repay the loans when they sold those bulbs for a profit. However, the moment bulbs began to decline, holders had to liquidate, sell their bulbs for whatever they could and declare bankruptcy. Lapham's Quarterly Magazine wrote in an article that substantial merchants were reduced to begging, while many a representative of a noble line saw the fortunes of his house ruined beyond redemption. To this day, people still use this story as a lesson. Even companies such as Stewart Investors who claim that it still provides valuable lessons for investors today, according to their website. Tulip mania has become an important symbol in the madness of crowds. This early bubble wasn't for silver or gold or the shares of a massive company, but a tulip, a mere flower. Others like insurance companies say that tulip mania teaches us four important lessons. The market often exhibits irrational exuberance, that it's important to look at fundamentals of a product or asset, to be sensible and not emotional, and to never be part of the rush. Even the site Financial Express uses tulip mania to explain similar lessons. After all, the rush and demand for a luxury impractical product seem to blur and cloud people's judgment. Though there have been other bubble bursts over the years, such as the South Seas bubble of the 1720s, the railroad bubble of the 1840s, and the bull market of the 1920s, tulip mania has been considered one of the first of its kind. However, are the stories too outlandish to be true? While tulip mania has been used as a warning about free market for decades, and it's even been featured in the book and movie adaptation, Tulip Fever, there's no evidence that tulip mania happened the way we've been told. Some of it may be true, but the actual mania parts are questionable to say the least. Sure, it's more fun to imagine tulip mania as we just described it, but chances are it was just a small bubble that burst among the super rich. According to the Smithsonian, it was Anne Goldgar, professor of early modern history at King's College London, who discovered the truth when she dug into archives to research for her book, Tulip Mania, Money, Honor, and Knowledge in the Dutch Golden Age. I always joke that the book should be called Tulip Mania, More Boring Than You Thought, Goldgar told the Smithsonian. I wonder if it wasn't because the publisher thought it might not sell as many copies. But anyway, to begin with, she explains that Dutch society gained an explosion in international commerce and a major demographic shift around the time of their war for independence from Spain. People were fascinated with the new and exotic goods pouring into the country, just as Clausius, the botanist we mentioned, seemingly fell in love with the tulip. And for the record, yes, the tulip was adored and was among the most prized flowers, that much is true. And the broken bulbs or striped ones did have more demand. However, as the Smithsonian explains, that's about as far as the tulip mania actually went. Naturalists wanted to find a way to reproduce them before they were aware of the mosaic virus that makes the bulbs less likely to reproduce in the first place, which no wonder they're more rare. The high market price for tulips to which the current version of tulip mania refers were prizes for particularly beautiful broken bulbs, writes economics Peter Garber. Since breaking was unpredictable, some have characterized tulip mania among growers as a gamble, with growers vying to produce better and more bizarre variegations and feathering. Goldgar spent years scouring the archives of Dutch cities and collected 17th century manuscript data from public notaries, small claims courts, wills, and more. In the end, she found six companies that were set up to sell tulips, only six. While tulip prices did spike, the most expensive one she found for 5,000 guilders was definitely an outlier. All in all, she discovered a grand total of 350 people involved in the trade and 37 people who paid more than 300 for a tulip bulb, the annual salary of a skilled craftsman at the time, by the way. Again, looking back at this in 2022, it seems absolutely ridiculous for tulips by our standards anyway to cost that much, but it's not quite the tulip mania that the stories seem to portray. As for where this myth began, we can actually trace that back to that Scottish journalist that I mentioned earlier, Charles McKay. Now, of course, he's the one who wrote that everyone from the wealthiest merchants to the poorest chimney sweeps jumped into the fray. According to Goldgar, this simply is not the case. There weren't that many people involved and the economic repercussions were pretty minor. I couldn't find anybody that went bankrupt. If there had been really a wholesale destruction of the economy as the myth suggests, then that would have been a much harder thing to face. Some merchants did pay astronomical prices for these tulips, absolutely, but it was money they could afford to lose by the sounds of it. When buyers refused to pay the price they previously agreed on, merchants did suffer because there wasn't much of a system in place to ensure buyers would keep their word. Courts didn't wanna get involved in this, so yeah, there were absolutely losses to be had, but nothing as extreme as the stories go. 
there were reputations lost and relationships broken, but this really just caused a level of cultural shock in an economy based on trade and elaborate credit relationships. So where did Charles McKay get his story from? Why make something like that up? Well, don't fully blame Charles. Instead, blame the propaganda. Dutch Calvinists were worried that the tulip propelled consumerism boom would lead to societal decay. As historian Simon Schama wrote in The Embarrassment of Riches, an interpretation of Dutch culture and the golden age, the prodigious quality of their success went to their heads, but it also made them a bit queasy. There were a lot of ideas floating around, like the mindset that God would punish people if they overreached. So the Dutch Calvinists whipped up some propaganda pamphlets publishing the stories we've heard, like the one about the sailor going to prison for eating a tulip and spread them around. As utterly ridiculous as all the stories are, it is worth noting that the super rich will still pay for things that we consider ridiculous to this very day. Really, tulips were just in fashion at the time. It was vogue to purchase tulips and people pay more for trends. Tulips were just in essence a 1630s trend among the super rich and the rest of us poors could only watch. Also, as an aside, while some sources do actually acknowledge Goldgar's recent research as her book was released in 2008, brief explanation videos online, even from channels like TED Ed, neglect to mention that this economic bubble wasn't nearly as extensive as we've been led to believe. Now, obviously there's no true harm in making movies and books about the tulip mania and writers have still referred to other trends as tulip mania when discussing Bitcoins and NFTs in the modern age. For example, one New York Times article questions if NFTs are the new frontier in the art world or just a modern tulip. In this article, Robert Norton, the CEO of Verisark, they verify artworks on the blockchain, says that we're living in a moment of collective hysteria, how many would describe the tulip mania days. People could potentially make the same mistakes that investment companies argue we need to learn from tulip mania, rushing into things, ignoring the fundamentals and flaws of a product and using emotions instead of sense to guide us. The art newspaper also argues that while tulip mania may not be real, the NFT trade is, as they put it. To be sure, new technology has brought us enormous benefits, but certain aspects such as speculation in cryptocurrencies also bring risk. The Nobel prize winning economist, Paul Krugman, writing in the New York Times has called Bitcoin a bubble wrapped in techno mysticism inside a cocoon of libertarian ideology. Selling tangible works of art in virtual currencies could end well in tears and they won't be digital. I do believe that tulip mania can be useful for making these comparisons and frankly, quite an interesting story too. There's no harm in sharing it. It's just important to be clear that much of tulip mania is actually just a myth. Otherwise, we're simply buying into 400 year old fear mongering. Now, before we continue on to talk about onions and the onion king himself, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors for this episode. This episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Now, I do love me some online shopping, but keeping track of promo codes, not so much. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones it finds to your cart. With Honey, you just shop online and when you check out, the Honey button appears and all you do is click apply coupons. And if Honey finds a working coupon, it'll apply that automatically. Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. Now, I've mentioned it in passing, but I'm in the process of moving and of course moving is absolute hell. And I've been buying a couple new pieces of like accessories for the house, like new rugs and things like that. So when I was online shopping, I was actually surprised that a fair amount of the furniture stores and stuff that I was looking at all got coupons from Honey and I saved like 10, 15, 20%, depending which store I went to. And it was kind of nice. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be just straight up missing out on savings. And by getting it, you're doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash MLM. That's joinhoney.com slash MLM. MLM. This episode is also sponsored by HelloFresh and they've got some meals this winter that are super warm and cozy. If you somehow don't know what HelloFresh is, they send fresh pre-portioned ingredients right to your door and they even send an easy to follow recipe along with your meal. Right now, HelloFresh has limited time recipes that offer twists on cozy classics from around the world like beef tenderloin and cheese fondue or miso sesame shrimp and bacon ramen. If that's not catching your interest, HelloFresh also has a series of fit and wholesome meals that are both nutritious and satisfying with low calorie 
and carb conscious options. HelloFresh also now has Hello Custom, which lets you customize your favorite meals by swapping out a protein or a side. So there's more choices tailored just for you. Now, my sister's a vegetarian, so obviously many proteins are not going to be attractive to her because she's not going to eat meat. So this was actually a really nice new feature that they added that allowed her to just substitute out meat so she could just add her own tofus in. And for me, like that miso sesame shrimp and bacon ramen sounds really good, but I cannot stand shrimp. So being able to swap that out for literally no shrimps or chicken or beef or pork or literally anything else is amazing. So go to hellofresh.com slash MLM16 and use code MLM16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's up to 16 free meals and three free gifts at hellofresh.com slash MLM16 and use code MLM16. All right, now that we've seen a form of futures trading in flowers, let's take a look at its more established form. In essence, it's when you're purchasing a future product. In Investopedia's hypothetical example, they use a silver manufacturer. Let's say that someone has won a contract to make silver medals for a sporting event that takes place in six months. And when this manufacturer won the contract, silver cost $10 an ounce. Perhaps at the moment, the manufacturer does not have the money or storage to buy the silver. So they can enter into what's called a silver futures contract, stating that they will purchase the silver at the price of $10 an ounce at a later date. This can be a win for the manufacturer if the price of silver goes up because they've saved money and it's taking the long position on a futures contract. On the other hand, this can be a win for the owner of a silver mine because if the price of silver plummets, they'll still be making $10 per ounce, even if that happens. Of course, plenty of factors like recessions and industrial demand can change the demand for silver and impact future trading. As you can imagine, during the recession at the start of COVID, the Commodity Future Tradings Commission or CFTC warned the public about investing in silver, gold, and other precious metals. The CARES Act or the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economics and Securities Act provided US households with stimulus checks in 2020. And considering what an uncertain and unstable year that was, many precious metals promoters and dealers were encouraging people to put their stimulus checks and retirement accounts towards silver and gold. Though the CFTC states that diversifying your portfolio can be a wise decision, precious metal dealers are oftentimes not licensed or registered to provide investment or trading advice to retail customers. They are typically salespeople who are paid commissions based on the products they sell. Futures have proven to be pretty volatile and silver fell drastically during the height of the pandemic. Then in January, 2021, it reached an eight year high when Reddit traders got involved. Silver futures actually rose 8% to $29.06 an ounce, meaning they traded at the highest level since February, 2013. Silver mining stocks rose as well. And the phrase hashtag silver squeeze was even trending on Twitter. While some have gone as far as to compare this to GameStop and AMC, two other companies that the internet became involved in in a similar manner, not everyone agrees with that assessment. The director of sales at ETFMG Prime Junior Silver Miners ETF, exchange traded funds, good Lord, what a name, has stated that the silver market is far more liquid, for instance, GameStop. So now that you have a very brief idea of what futures trading is, let's get into how one man managed to ban futures trading for onions. See, futures trading really took off in Chicago during the mid 1800s. Emily Lambert, author of The Futures, The Rise of the Spectator and the Origins of the World's Biggest Markets, discusses this at length in her book. She refers to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, also known as the Merc, a sort of men's club. It was a scrappy, younger, annoying sister to the Chicago Board of Trade, she says. This was a place for opportunity seekers. And though it's difficult to pinpoint a moment where future trading was born, it was in 1865 that the Chicago Board of Trade adopted rules for this kind of trading. One of the very first men to corner the future market was Benjamin. Hutchinson, otherwise known as Old Hutch. He was a farm boy from Massachusetts who was later described by a reporter as someone with the complexion of a liver sausage and weighed only 100 pounds. According to Lambert, he went into the meat packing business, became a banker, lent money to men at the Board of Trade, then became a member of the board itself. In time, he became the quote, king of the wheat pit and was worth more than $10 million in 1881. And in today's money, that's gonna be around 300 million US dollars, give or take. As for the pits, though, Those are raised octagonal shaped structures where trading takes place. Old Hutch had some trading debts in the end when he lost millions on corn futures contracts, proving just how ruthless the market can be. However, there was one king so controversial that his legacy is still recounted to this day, the Onion King. 
otherwise known as Vincent Kasuga. Born in 1915 and five foot four onion grower from New York, Kasuga bought a farm in Pine Island and had an enormous shed filled with onions on his property. He sold the Campbell's soup and the US Army. And when he first tried his hand at trading wheat at the Board of Trade, he lost everything. Kasuga promised his wife he would stop, but instead he discovered onion trading. According to Lambert, for years he would fly to Chicago on Mondays to trade, then back to New York on Thursdays to farm. During the mid 1900s, Kasuga built himself a reputation as a legend, apparently as a dedicated Catholic Catholic, he donated so much money to the Vatican that he actually had private audiences with three popes and rode in the Pope's elevator. He supposedly carried a gun onto the trading floor and enjoyed flying planes, but managed to fly one into the ground only to insist on getting out of his hospital bed and going home, despite being in a full body cast. There were also a few tawdry stories about his sexual exploits, though these couldn't really be confirmed. Apparently Kasuga's nephew did meet with Lambert and told her that some of the stories were true, though I'm not sure we'll ever know just how much they've been twisted over the years. Regardless of some of the more fantastical claims about the Pope and crashing planes, there were a few stories about him that were definitely true. The first is that he bought cars for other brokers at the Merck. A handful received Buicks, but one former chairman at the Merck, Nade Wordheimer, was gifted a big fancy Cadillac. Aside from some of these fantastical gifts, he'd also give bribes to people, such as the local US Weather Bureau. He apparently had them issue a frost warning for the region so that the price of onion futures would go up. Kasuga was so determined to corner the market that by 1955, he and his business partner slash fellow trader, Sam Siegel, controlled 98% of the onions in Chicago. With such a grip on the market, the pair were able to essentially control the price of onions themselves. They'd buy onions from growers and keep the price high, up to about $4 a bag. According to the CTFC, trading in onions futures on the exchange is conducted in units of one contract or car lot containing 650 pound bags, more or less. There were about 442 total future onion contracts in November, 1955, if I'm reading their legal documents correctly. And of those 442, Kasuga alone held 75.8% of them with 335 contracts. Plus, of the 401 car lots that came into Chicago around the time, he received 323 of them to settle his own futures contracts. So while he didn't own the entire market, to say he was dominating it would not be an understatement. Around this time in late 1955, he also purchased a net total of 383 car lots of onion futures and his partner Siegel bought 294. He truly was the onion king. Now, Kasuga owned a ton of onions and was able to inflate prices. There's nothing illegal about what he did until this point, really. It's just business. However, this is not where the story ends. In fact, we're about to get into some murky insider trading territory. See, he decided that as owner of 98% of the onions, he could also decrease the price. How would this make him money, you might ask? Well, that's because Kasuga decided to start going short or short selling. At the time, it makes sense that everyone thought the price of onions would go up because, well, that's exactly what had been happening at the time. But he took a short position, betting that the price of onions would go down. You can do this by borrowing shares from a broker and then selling them at the current market price. For example, let's say that company X sells its shares for $10 each and I wanted to short sell. I would go to a broker and have them borrow shares for me. Let's say they borrowed 10 shares. So I sold them for $100 total. Sometime later, if the stock goes down to $5, I could buy back those same shares for only $50 and return them to the broker, effectively making that difference of $50. Now, obviously this doesn't account for broker's fees, but this is the concept behind short selling. This can be incredibly risky because naturally if the stock goes up, you'll owe whatever the difference is instead. There's theoretically no limit to the amount you could lose. For Kasuga, the risk wasn't there because he knew for a damn fact that the price would go down since he had the capability to flood the market with onions. And that's exactly what he did. Between November, 1955 and March, 1956, Kasuga and Siegel held short positions on onion futures. This completely dumbfounded those close to him with one grower shipper, Dave Slinger saying, "'I was completely dumbfounded because I thought they were on the long side of the market. I do not know exactly what was said after he made that suggestion, but I was left with the impression that he had reversed his position, that he was going to short the market and possibly his conscience was bothering him and he wanted Gehring, another grower shipper, to also get in on the short side. I told him that I didn't think that. I thought that they were going to reverse their position and go short the market. The group should be called together and should do it together. 
Mr. Kosuga answered that that would never do. It would wreck the market in a matter of minutes and go down to 50 cents. That the only way to do it was to control it somewhat. And only one person knew about it. Gehring refused, stating that he wouldn't do anything unless the group acted together. And this is just my opinion, but from what I can make of Slinger's statement here, the Onion King Kasuga felt guilty knowing what he was about to do and how it was going to hurt farmers. Still, rather than reconsidering stabbing them in the back, Kosuga knew he could make a lot of money from short selling and flooding the market with onions. In the end, his greed won out. Kosuga oversaturated the market to the point where people couldn't give onions away. In July, 1956, Time Magazine wrote an article called Odorous Onions, in which they described how onions went from about $2.75 in August, 1955 to only 10 cents in March, 1956. Kasuga and Siegel had short positions for about 1,200 car lots. And according to Time, they allegedly shipped some of their aging onions out of Chicago and had them culled, restored, and repackaged, and then sent back in order to make it look as if large quantities of new onions were pouring back into town. The Commodity Exchange Authority, or CEA, leaped on this quickly as it wasn't exactly hard to notice the price manipulation plot. By the time Kasuga and Siegel were scheduled to give their rebuttal at a hearing in Chicago, onions had been dumped into the river, boxcars filled with onions clogged rail yards, and the onions themselves were worth about half as much as the 20 cent bag they were stored in. Onion farmers were literally calling orphanages, hospitals, schools, in desperation just to get rid of them. Kasuga made over $8 million, which would be about $80 million today from his short selling, while these farmers were selling a worthless crop. Some farmers allegedly game-ended themselves after they went bankrupt too. Kasuka, on the other hand, while testifying to Congress, was asked if it was true that he owned 97% of the onions. Being told not to perjure himself, Kasuga corrected them and said that was incorrect. He owned 98. Kasuga had stabbed onion farmers in the back in a major way, and they were determined to see that this never happened again. Those in Michigan called their congressman, Gerald Ford, who would later become the president, who got congressmen to talk to traders, lawyers, but it was hard to actually convict Kasuga of committing a crime. At the time, the laws surrounding market manipulation were, as NPR puts it, super vague and hard to enforce. Kasuga simply told Congress, if it's against the law to make money in the United States, then I'm guilty of something. In the end, they suspended his license for 10 months and gave him a small fine, only a fraction of the 8 million he made. Of course, the problem wasn't onion futures, but future trading and market manipulation in general. Kasuga may have exploited the vague laws and done a fantastic job of exposing the cracks in the trade system, but it didn't seem like Congress actually wanted to fix these issues one by one. Instead, they hoped to placate the farmers that wanted to see the futures market killed altogether. Gerald Ford proposed a bill to ban onion future trading, which was ultimately successful as the Onion Futures Act was signed in August, 1958 by President Eisenhower. Not everyone agreed with this, such as Merck's president, E.B. Harris, who stated, If there be abuses in onion futures trading, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange will be the first to condemn and help correct. But we submit that burning down the barn to find a suspected rack is a pretty drastic remedy. Even so, the ban has stood the test of time. And to this day, onions are the only agricultural product banned from the futures trading market in the US. Some economists argue that this actually will only make onions cost more for us in the long run, since onion farmers have a harder time planning out their crops. Now, oddly enough, as selfish as an act of what Kasuga did seems to be, he was later named Pine Island Citizen of the Year for, of all things, his philanthropy. In 1972, the Times Herald Record wrote that as of 1965, Kasuga built the Jolly Onion Inn, which became a well-known and highly respected restaurant, even one of the most popular in Orange County. They called Kasuga's success the typical story of the American dream come true too, and said that his donations to St. Stanislaw Catholic Church in Pine Island paid for their building ramp, new carpeting, and refurbishing the pews. All in all, Kasuga seems complicated, generous in some aspects, but selfish in others. While I understand it's probably pretty difficult to feel a sense of sympathy towards the massive banks that scammers say like Anna Delvey have hurt, Kasuga's actions have hurt onion farmers, and I'm not so sure that buying a church ramp is really going to change that. But that of course is my opinion. And with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure you click on my Linktree link. It will have all of my links to my social media and other projects that I'm involved in too. And if you want even additional episodes, movie nights and all that fun stuff, make sure to check out my Patreon. We're always doing some fun stuff over there too. Thank you all so much for joining me for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.